week. <laughs> I actually was thinking um, of the other night when Dad was talking about, you can, you can be seated, sorry. Um, I was actually talking, or uh, thinking the other night when Dad was at Bible study, and he was talking about how that um, your testimony and the amazing testimonies that the people of, um, uh, of God have, it's amazing what he's brought you from and what, you know, he's delivered you a lot of alcohol and drugs and bad, bad things that have happened. And um, that is so amazing that God's power does that, that his blood that flows can still, after all these years, it still is, um, is has the ability to wash our sins away. And I, um, whenever we had those testimonies, I remember somebody once said that I had grown up with and said, you know, I don't have that kind of testimony. And neither do I. I don't have a testimony of how God delivered me from drugs and alcohol and, and all those things. But what I do have is a testimony of how God has kept me. Yes. He um, placed a desire in my heart many, many, many years ago. I don't even remember when I didn't have a desire to live for God. Um, he filled me with the Holy Ghost when I was seven years old. Um, he has never, I've never desired to go out into the world. I've never desired to have drugs or alcohol or, or whatever it was. And that is only because of God's keeping power. That is just a testimony to what God has done for me. That I like to think of it as he loved me so much that he didn't want to let me even try to experience those things. That he kept me. Now, I love him so, so much today. He asked me to sing a special, but that is my testimony this morning. And I wonder, does anybody have a burning testimony that you just have, you can't go another day without telling of God's goodness? God has been so good to me my whole life. He's, he's kept me, like you say, He has kept me from things that I wasn't even aware of. And it seems like, you know, He knows what we have need of even before we ask. He just wants us to ask of Him and believe when we ask. And He will do whatever His perfect will is. And I'm so glad that He loves us enough that if we do have a tendency Drift away, whatever. He draws us back to his love. And I just worship today. Praise the Lord. Brother Randy, go ahead. You know, I have a, a life that was, uh, I guess, not out of hand. Uh, but I was in a, a business society that uh, involved this kind of behavior uh, of drinking and, and, and smoking cigarettes and uh, kind of in a party life way uh, when I visited my distributors. Uh, but I also, when I was home, uh, I had my own little time that I devoted to having a drink. Uh, uh, sometimes too, and, uh, and once in a while, or even more. But uh, one night, my wife just just came out, and, and she never did, never did say anything about what I was doing. Uh, but she just said, "Babe, don't you realize?" how much time is taken away from me and Randy. And that's all it took. Uh, I'm so tied up in my own, uh, I guess you say stress and, and what have you. Uh, but from that very time, and I told her, It'll never be a, again. It'll never happen again. And to this day, from then, and that's been 20 years plus, um, I put that down. And the Lord gave me the strength that the love for my wife and my child just gave me the impact to 
push me on through. But I later uh, went to church and made a, a vow to God that we were going to serve Him. Uh, I didn't know what capacity and how or where, but she said, let's go to my church. And that's where we went, and that's where I ended up. But the Lord has brought me away from a lot of things that, that could have changed my life. But He did change my life that night. And I no, I no longer uh, participated in those things. My distributors and uh, my uh, we group were friends in years. Uh, but I said, I want you to understand something. I've changed in my life. And I want you to consider that too. And you know some of those guys did. Uh, they might have changed in their life. Uh, they no longer wanted to do that. That, that visitation, that party type. Uh, atmosphere. Uh, we had business and we had friendship and we still do today. You know, a number of them that, uh, that I call frequently. Uh, but it all started in, in a business relate and it ended up affecting my family. And the Lord took me away from that uh, he reinforced my desire to just let that be and leave it alone. Uh, I'm blessed now that my children uh, oh God I have some grandsons that uh, live in Tulsa that that are carrying on a life, some of them, that it's not the way they grew up. And they're raising their family. And, and they've, they've brought me some great granddaughters and sons. And, and I, I pray for them and that they'll go back to what their bringing up was all about. Uh, I hope they learn, and I hope they don't give up anything uh, while they're going through this period. And I pray for my family, and I ask prayer for my family. And all, of my, all of my kids, and my grandkids, and my great-grandkids, and I just know the Lord will. Just hand on me. for sure. I know that we sing this song a lot. I know it's a song that we all know about. Um, I love you, Lord. And there's that part in the song that says, I've known him as a father and I've known him as a friend. And I've lived in the goodness of God. And every time I think about it, I think about it over my life. And I know that you do too. Um, about all the goodness. It comes down to just loving God and wanting to serve him. I heard one time that a thankful heart will never backslide. And I believe that. Like if you just can remember what God has done for you. And how good he has been. The trials look a little bit less, and the darkness seems a little bit less dark. And uh, when you can think about the Lord, so let's just sing this all together. You guys can stay seated. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me, and all my days I've been.
to know that He cares. Yes. Huh. Amen. To know that it doesn't matter if you've only been walking with the Lord just for a little while, a short time, or if you've been serving Him for a long, long time. Amen. I was on the way to church and I told Jamie, I'm like, I've got a message to preach, but I don't have a scripture to read. But I thought about it a little earlier than just while she was singing that song. We can have confidence this morning because we know from the Bible, Hebrews chapter number 13, verse number 8, it's very simple scripture. It just simply says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, Forever. He does not change. You can depend on Him. Amen. And what an assurance to know that He does not change. Amen. He does not. Praise the Lord. I'm going to preach just a little bit this morning. I'll be I say it's not going to be long, and usually when I say that, I preach longer than I thought possible. I do have something on my heart that has been running through my mind for a couple of weeks now, and I don't know if um, Sister Conrad even knows, but she and I had a conversation <coughs> right before church. And it was confirmation to me that what I'm about to preach is the will of God for this church, for this service today. I've been reading in the Bible. I started out, we're going to, Jamie and I are reading through the Bible. And we have one of those uh, one year Bibles. So you, you start, you read a a little bit each day it starts in Genesis, obviously, and then in Matthew, and it kind of, kind of breaks it up a little bit. Um, but I found that today is January 22nd, and I'm already several days behind because I don't know what it is, but just in our flesh. Anytime we purpose to do something for God or to bring our, us closer to God, there's always things that come up. There's always things that try to distract, to take away your time. And if you are purposeful in it, amen, it will distract you. But in reading, starting out, Obviously, Genesis chapter number one, the very first verse, the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters. And then it was in verse three when he spoke and said, Let there be light. And at the spoken word of God, the light shined in the darkness. We read through the creation story, starting with the very first chapter. You can quickly detect, and it's easily understood, that God placed a greater emphasis on man than he did anything else that he created. Everything that he did was special. And it was special to God, but humanity was the masterpiece of God. You can read through and he spoke the word. And when he spoke, it became reality. Everything was created at the spoken word of God, just like the light. He commanded that light to be separated from darkness. Everything that he created 
was spoken, except when it came to the man. Genesis chapter number 2, verse 7, the Bible says that the Lord formed a man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Yes. And man became a living soul. Amen, amen. Didn't say that about any other creature, no beast of the field, no fowl of the air, none of that. Amen. Just the man. Everything else he spoke into existence, but the man, he formed it with his hands. Yeah. And he breathed life into it. Out of all creation, man was a masterpiece. The reason that you and I were created was to commune with God. To be friends with God. Nothing else in creation meant as much to him as the man. It was the man that God gave dominion over the beasts of the field, right. the fowls of the air. It was the man that he spoke to and said to go forth and multiply, replenish the land. Even though from the very creation, that he desired to have a relationship. God never forced that on anyone. He never did, and he never will. <laughs> you can choose to follow after God, much like Brother Randy talked about in his testimony. You can make a decision that I'm not going to live this way any longer, that I'm going to live close to God, and I want to have that communion and that relationship with Him. Amen. And you can enjoy that, but God won't force that on you. Right. He lets that decision be yours. And since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, God has wanted nothing more than to have that relationship yeah. restored that was lost in Eden. Amen. Amen. And to be reconciled to man once again. Amen. In fact, as you read through the Bible, you quickly understand that everything from that creation story and the fall and the separation when he dismissed them from the Garden of Eden, everything was leading to a point of restoration. Right. It was so that that relationship could be restored. You can follow it. You can trace it all through Scripture, all the way to Calvary. That's what it was all about. Amen. That's why He came and became yes. that sacrifice yes. and paid that price of sin yes. that we could not pay on our own. It was so that that relationship yes. could be restored again. That innocence, if you will, yes. could be restored. Thank you, Lord. But no matter how much God desires to reconcile with you this morning, He won't force Himself upon anybody. Amen. But if you will make an effort today to move closer to Him, He will meet you at the point of your need. Amen. All you've got to do is make yourself available. Take a step toward God and He will be there. Amen. He regards mankind so highly that He will wait for you to move toward Him. Amen. He's always done it that way. He always has waited for humanity to lead his people back into fellowship with him, whether it's an individual or a nation or a people. Right. Amen. He always waits on the man. You can read it in Scripture for yourself. When there was a need, God may have been able to supply that need. As a matter of fact, the very first miracle that he ever performed at the wedding came of the Galilee. Amen. They needed wine. He could have just filled those vessels with it, but he asked them, he said, you go and tell them, fill the vessels with water. And when they had done their part, then God did his part. That's right. just how it works. He waits for a man or a woman that will step out in faith. Amen. And when they do, God always supplies them. Yes, Samuel chapter 17, verse 7. You all know the story. The Bible says there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines. 
to challenge the armies of Israel. The Bible says that for 40 days, Goliath stood in the valley and challenged and asked for a man, somebody to come and fight for the army of the Lord. You all understand that God could have destroyed Goliath at any time. He could have struck him down at any moment that he chose to do that, but God didn't do that. He waited on a man. He waited on somebody, amen, that will stand up and fight for the armies of the Lord. And when David took a stand against the giant, amen, when he walked out and confronted him, you know, God was with David and gave him the victory. Yes. That's just how the Lord works. It happened the same in the story of Nehemiah. Jerusalem had no walls around it. Its gates had been burned. They had been destroyed. In that day that we're talking about, it was a reproach for a city not to have walls. Because if a city didn't have walls, it was powerless to protect itself from the attack of the enemy. Any opposing force could come against them and utterly defeat them because they had no position from which to defend themselves. Right. And when Nehemiah heard of the condition of the city, and he heard that there had no walls and the gates had been burned and destroyed, the Bible says that Nehemiah sat down and he wept for Jerusalem. Yes. It wasn't just that he sat down and had a pity party and cried and said, oh, how could this happen? No, it was a type of prayer. He went to prayer and he wept and allowed a burden to come upon him for the city of Jerusalem yes. to the point that he couldn't just stand there knowing that there was no walls and there was no gates and the city was defenseless. Amen. But a burden overcome him to the point that he went to Jerusalem and he led the people to rebuild those walls. Amen. He saw the need of the city. Yes. And he stayed until the wall was finished and Jerusalem was restored to power. Amen. Because he knew it was not the will of God for that city to be weak and to be defenseless. But even in that, God waited, and he allowed that city to be crumbled, to be overtaken, to waste away to nothing until somebody got a burden, a burden to do something. And when they did, God was with them, gave them strength. Nehemiah saw a need in Jerusalem, and he may have been very comfortable just where he was at. We like to say people like to stay in their comfort zone, and I like to think that that's probably where Nehemiah was at. Yeah. Amen. But there was a burden that came upon him. Amen. And in order to restore Jerusalem, he went and built a wall. Yes, amen. Amen. The Bible says that the reason that was possible, it wasn't just Nehemiah by himself, but the Bible says that that was made possible because the people had a mind to work. When he got there, amen, and he shared the burden, there was people there that were willing to help build the wall. You know the story. Some worked while others stood guard, and, and they changed that around, and, and, and all of them working together is how that wall came to be. They put forth the effort. They did the work. And God blessed them. Yes. Yes. Amen. I don't understand where people ever got the idea that we just show up for church and we watch God perform. Mm -hmm. Where we just come in and sit down and we expect the presence of the Lord to be there and we expect to feel the blessings of God, but we don't feel like we need to be involved in any of that. Where did we ever get the idea that we don't have any responsibility to pray or to seek the yes. face of God or for ask for Him and His presence to be here? I like to feel the presence of God, but He is not just um, 
on, on a, a wish list for us or whatever you want to say where we just come and expect him to be here. He's not right. promised that other than to say that we do have the promise that we'll yes. be gathering his yes. name, that he yes. would be in the midst of them. Yes. Yes. Amen. But we don't ever need to come to the place where we don't really, we don't have to pray. We don't have All to right. do anything and just expect God to show up and show out. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. God called Jonah to preach to a city that needed revival. Nineveh would have never experienced that revival if Jonah had not went and preached. And you know the story how he didn't want to go. He was reluctant, but he did go and he did preach. I believe that he had, if he had not went, that God would have destroyed the city. But because of his obedience, and he did go, and he did preach to them, the Bible says there was great revival in Nineveh because Jonah obeyed the voice of God. Yes. Okay. Esther, chapter number 3 through 5, you all know the story, and I know I'm not telling you anything that you haven't heard before, but we're going to get somewhere. The Jews were about to be destroyed. And you understand how God had placed Esther in a position where she was able to make a difference for her people. And knowing that her life could be required if she went in unbidden to the king, amen, there was a burden that came on her. And, and she went in to the king because she had to do something. She couldn't just sit there and watch her people be destroyed when there was a chance that she could do something to make a difference. Right. And she was overcome with it to the point that she said, if I perish, I perish. But I'm going to go in and I'm going to make my petitions known to the king. Amen. It was the burden that led her to the king's chamber. It was a willingness of her to sacrifice her own life so that others might be saved. You can read scripture after scripture where God would wait for a man or a woman. And when they gathered up enough courage, they had enough faith or was moved by a burden to the point that they did something, God was always there to help and to provide victory. Yes. Amen. We understand that and those examples are in scripture for our benefit. Amen. It is no secret that this city that we live in, Northwest Arkansas in general, if you will, needs revival. Yes. They need God in such a desperate way. Yes. You can hear it on the news. You can read it in the newspaper. It happens all the time. Almost daily, someone is being shot and someone is being killed. And and. It's things that we like to think that it's common to hear that in New York City or maybe New Orleans or a big city, Los Angeles. That's common. But it's common here among yes. us. We don't need to stick our head in the sand and think that the adversary is not working in this community because he is. Right. And this city needs revival. Yes. They need to know that God can make a difference in their life. There are people out here, just neighbors of ours, friends of ours, that are searching for something better than what they have right now. Jesus is really what they're looking for, but some of them don't even understand that. They need Hallelujah. somebody that is going to go to them and share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Maybe like Brother Randy is telling his friends, you know what, there's a different way to live. And I'm making a change in my life, and maybe you should consider that too. Amen. And that they need somebody to tell them. Yes. yes. Amen. That responsibility falls on the people of God. Amen. We are ambassadors for Christ, is what the Bible says. Yes. We are God's representative in this city. We are his voice, if you will, and it's our responsibility to share the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to people that are hurting, people that are desperate, they're looking for a change, they want their lives to be different, but they don't know how to change, they're looking for somebody to help them. And God can pour out his spirit whenever 
and wherever he wants. We understand that. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But God will not give us the revival that we desire to see, that we are praying for and that we're looking for until we decide to do something about it. Amen. He's only going to move after we decide to do something different and move beyond our comfort zone and move beyond where we're at. And when we decide to step out in faith and proclaim the things of God and in the promises of the Lord, when we put our faith into action, then God will give the increase that we're looking for. He'll send the revival. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. We've no doubt God is moving in this church and he's done miraculous things for us to be where we're at right now. But I've come to tell you that if you look around, there's nothing else that needs to be done. For a while, it's like, well, we need to get the walls, and we need to get the carpet, and we need to get the paint, and we need to get the plumbing. We need to do all this before we're really comfortable inviting people to the house of the Lord. But if you look around right now, it's what I told Sister Conrad, there is nothing that needs to be done to prevent us from having revival now. It's left up to us. Amen. If we want to do that, we've got to do it, and we need to do it now. Amen. I'm stirred in my spirit because I'm not satisfied with just coming to church and singing songs and feeling the blessings of the Lord. I'm glad and I love that. Amen. And I want it to be that way every time. But I want to see our altars filled with people that need the baptism of the Holy Ghost and watch them speak in tongues as the Spirit of God gives them the essence. Hallelujah. We need revival. desire for things to be different or if you long to see those things that we're not seeing regularly, then we need to look at ourselves because that scripture that I read, if anything has changed, it's not God. Right. Amen. God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes. Amen. So it's left up to us if we want to move beyond the point of revival that we're at, if we want to see a deeper move of God, it's left up to us. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I'm disturbed because I think it should be a common occurrence for people to be in our altar seeking the Holy Ghost, yes. being filled with the Holy Ghost, to yes. be delivered from bondage and addiction. Yes. Amen. They need to be able to come here, and there needs to be such a power and a presence of God that when they're here, they need change. They need different than what they were. They may not even know what they're coming into, but they need to know what they're walking out of. Amen. They need to have an encounter with Jesus. I understand. I know that God is moving because we feel His presence. Amen. And He's done many miracles, many wonderful things for us that we can testify about of how He's brought us from where we were to where we're at. We understand that. His Spirit is very evident here in every service. We can feel the presence of God. So why are our altars not reflecting that same move of God with souls being filled with the Holy Ghost? Why is that? I have just one answer for you. And it is simply this. Because children are never born. Whether it be natural birth, whether it be spiritual birth, without a burden... Children are never born. Somebody has to bear a burden. Amen. There has to be travail. And yes, it's uncomfortable and it can even be painful. Amen. But until Zion travails, sons and daughters are not going to be born into the kingdom of God. It requires burden and it requires sacrifice. And yes, I know that's uncomfortable. And yes, I understand that's not popular to hear. But that is the truth. Amen. If we're going to see miracles among us. Amen. If we're going to see the desires of our heart. Somewhere, somebody has got to be driven to their knees. And cry out to God for somebody to make a difference. Amen. Praise 
the Lord. We've seen many miracles. But there is a difference between, between children being born into the kingdom of God and seeing the miraculous. Miracles take place because of the faith that we have in God. Right. We understand and we believe that He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Yes. That is faith. And that's where miracles come from. But that is not what births children into the work or the house of God, the church. Amen. It is a burden that's going to do that. It's sacrifice that's going to do that. Praise the Lord. And until somebody is willing to weep between the porch and the altar for souls, then we're not going to see children born into the church right. like we desire to right. see them. Right. God is not going to move in that capacity yes. until we move, until we do something right. different. Amen. Until we get our hearts and our spirit yes. right. And when we do that, then God will move. Yes. Amen. And we'll see the revival that we've been dreaming of. Amen. When we gather up Amen. enough courage, Allow God to place a burden on our hearts yes. for this city, yes. for our lost friends and our family. Amen. When we begin to travail for souls, God is ready and willing to pour out His Spirit. Amen. He's just waiting Amen. on us. Yes. Why is it that you always, like I talked about, when you try to do something that I'm going to, a purpose in my heart that I'm going to move closer to God. That this year, 2023, I'm going to be closer to Him than I have. I'm going to go back to those old paths and those places when I knew God and, and our relationship was so strong and I felt like He was just right there with me. When you begin to do that, even in prayer, I'm going to start praying more. Why do you think it is that the devil tries so hard to stop that? He'll send distractions. He'll try to... Stop your prayer. Amen. It seems like we're trying to get a prayer meeting going in the church. There's never a night that's good for anyone. There's never a time that's good for anyone. And it's because the devil understands the power of prayer. He knows that if this church goes to prayer, what is possible? He understands what will happen when we begin to focus on prayer and we focus on souls and we focus on revival. So he'll do anything he can to distract us from that. Amen. God does not change. He still waits for a man or a woman to step out in faith. Amen. So if you're wondering what's changed, all I can tell you for sure is it's not God. Amen. 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 I told you I've been thinking about this a couple of weeks. It was about two weeks ago that Brother Dixon was teaching a Wednesday night lesson, and he mentioned that some of our younger people, like my sons, that they may not have ever experienced the kind of revival that some of us remember from many years ago. They just hear us talk about how we would have revival for weeks at a time. We'd have church every night, and you never knew if you was going to get out at 8 o'clock or if you were going to be there at midnight. And we really just let God lead and have His way, and there was tremendous moves of God. Great times of revival and harvest. Amen. Miracles. Great moves of God. And his point in teaching and talking about that was to provoke us to think about what is different today and what has changed, what is, what is different now. And to me, the answer was obvious. And... Just hang on. I, we've got a... It's a little joke among my sons that when somebody's about to say something, that's what they, they were like, just hang on, I'm about to say something. <laughs> the answer is obvious. If God doesn't change, then it's 
it's us that's changed. Now, I remember on the way home, driving home from that service on Wednesday night, I told my wife that the problem is that we've allowed things into our lives and into our homes that distract us from God or keep us from focusing on anything that's spiritual. And while you may not think any of those things are just blatant sin, there's a scripture that says it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Amen. And when those things accumulate in your lives, they push God further and further to the side. That's why you find it difficult to find time to pray or even to read the Bible. It's because there is an enemy that knows if he can distract you from your purpose, then he can keep you from reaching your potential in God. But I told her that we've allowed those things to happen, to come into our lives, things that when I was a young kid in church, that those things were fiercely taught against and preached against. But now we've allowed those things into our homes and into our lives, and we wonder why church seems different now than what it was then. Did we really not understand that these things would hinder our walk with God? Really? Did we think that we could allow those things into our lives and that it wouldn't distract us from our purpose? Do we really not understand? Or do we just like being comfortable? Do we like, would we rather avoid the burden and avoid the sacrifice? Because it's not comfortable. But as a society, you just hang on. Amen. You can do what you want to with this, but I'm going to tell you the truth. As a society and as a church, we've allowed things into our homes that were taught against and preached against. We took prayer out of our schools, and we've seen that it's had a devastating effect on our children. The front. There's not prayer in our homes like there used to be. Amen. And now we even find it difficult to pray in our churches. People can't seem to find the time to pray. And sometimes we can't even find time to make it to the house of God for service. But instead, we've allowed movies and TV and music and video games and worldly influences to occupy our minds and consume all of our time. Right. Amen. And every one of these, whether you want to admit it or not, every one of these have a spirit and they have an identity, amen, that is contrary to the things of God. And you can say it's not sin, and maybe it's not, but I'm telling you, it will distract, and it will push God to the side to the point that He is not the priority in your life anymore. Yes. Amen. Right. That's true. Right. Amen. Amen. It will, it will distract us from our focus, and nothing about it is godly. These are things that are common among us today, and yet we seem surprised that we don't experience God like we did when we limited those influences in our lives. Amen. Amen. It's the truth. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. I understand that we live in a different world today than what we did when I was a small child. I understand things are different and technology is different. Amen. And it's a totally different world than the world that I grew up in. Amen. But I also understand that it's very easy to use that as an excuse to do nothing for the kingdom of God. Right. 
Amen. We can keep our same routine and we can stay in our comfort zone and all the while people are dying and going to hell and they need somebody that will bear a burden. Amen. And cry out for the people of this city and this community. Amen. They need God and they need to know that there is a better way to live. But it is so easy for us to take our ease inside. Because to have revival and to pursue after it requires effort. Amen. It's not fun when you're fighting against giants. But it's necessary to conquer territory and to have revival. Amen. It can be uncomfortable. And it can require us to change some things. It can require us to rearrange some priorities in our lives and make sure that the things of God are of utmost importance in our lives and our homes. Amen. It can be uncomfortable. But church, I've come to tell you this morning that it's time for us to move beyond the distractions. Amen. The enemy tries to place those in our lives to keep us from having revival. But it's time for us to move beyond that. Amen. And move toward revival. It's time for us to, to have him be number one in our homes. Amen. For it to happen in our church, it first has to happen in your heart. Right. And then you can influence your home. And then you can influence your church and your community. But as it always does, it comes down to an individual. There are seasons that God deals with churches and there are seasons of revival and we understand that. But it always comes back to an individual relationship. Amen. And I know that it's the desires of everyone here to see revival in this church and that's why I'm not afraid to stand here and preach what I'm preaching this morning. I understand that we're moving in the right direction. And I want you to know that I appreciate the purposeful intent of coming early to pray. Yeah. We did that last week and we, the results were just what you would think they would be. There was a powerful anointing of God that was on Brother Dixon when he preached. There was a mighty move of God in the service and it was a result of focused intent prayer right. before that service right. started. Amen. And God moved because we moved. Mm -hmm. That's just how it works. Yes. Amen. And I know that there are people in this church that have a burden for revival. And I've heard travail come forth in our prayer meetings. I understand that. And I believe that God has placed us here much like he placed Esther in a position of influence. Amen. I believe that we've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Yes. And I believe that God has afforded us an opportunity, even this morning, to move beyond where we're at spiritually and take another step toward our destiny in the spirit. Yes. To move closer to God than what we were. Amen. Amen. I'm not saying anybody's backslid. I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong. I'm just saying that there's an opportunity for you to step closer and to walk closer to God. Amen. Amen. The story is in Ezekiel chapter number 22. Jerusalem was in a backslidden state. The things of God had become very common among the people. The Sabbath day was not even sacred anymore. Mm -hmm. There was no pure worship that took place in Jerusalem. It was into that situation, Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, that God said, I sought for a man among them that would make up the hedge, would stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. Amen. Some of the saddest words I've ever read in Scripture, he said, but I found none. Mm -hmm. He looked 
but he couldn't find anybody with a burden, amen, that would go to their knees, prayer, pray for the city, that he wouldn't destroy it. I wonder when God looks at us on a morning just like today, I wonder what he sees. I wonder if he'll find anybody that's willing to move beyond where you're at right now. Does he see anybody that truly has a burden for the lost souls of this community? Can he find somebody willing to stand up for the cause of Christ? Can he find somebody willing to go into the field and work? The Bible says that there's a field that is ripe of the harvest. And I can't help but feel in my spirit that we're at harvest time. It's time for the harvest. Amen. It's time for revival. But is there anybody that's willing to go out into the field and work? That harvest has to be gathered. It has to be brought into the storehouse. And that's going to take effort. And it's going to take somebody willing to do the work. When God looks at you this morning, do you wonder what he sees? Because only you really know. I mean, you can come, you might be able to fool me, you might be able to fool your neighbors, but you're never going to fool God. Right. He knows. Yes. The Bible says he knows the very thoughts and the intents of your heart. He knows you better than anybody else. So what does he see when he looks at you? Does he see somebody that's willing to move beyond where you're at this morning? Does he see somebody that truly has a desire to move closer to God? And it doesn't matter what level of spiritual maturity you may be at today, or you may not be spiritual at all. It doesn't matter. Where you're at, God is calling every one of us. Everybody that's in this house, God is calling for you to take a step closer to Him than what you are right now. Amen. We have an opportunity and that's all I've come to tell you this morning is that we have an opportunity today to move beyond where you're at and to move closer to God. Amen. I'd like for you to stand with me if you would and the musicians can come. I know that this type of preaching doesn't make you shout. But I hope it makes you strong. Because if you can move closer to God than what you were when you came in this morning, if you leave here with a greater determination that I'm going to do whatever I can do to walk closer to Him, that's what the desire is today. And I know it's quiet. But I know that God is talking to some hearts and I know that you have to look inward. But I want to tell you that your response this morning to the Spirit of God is here in this house right now. Your response is your testament of how you plan to approach God. Because I can't make you pray. I can't make you have a burden. I can't give you the desire to witness or to share what God has done in your life. I can't do that. 
for you. I can only do that for me. But I'm going to open the altars right now. And I would invite you to come and pray. To talk to God just for a few minutes this morning. And it doesn't matter if you've been in church a long time. Or if this is the very first time you've ever come to church. You're welcome to come and pray at the altar of the Lord this morning. If you need the Holy Ghost, He can give that to you this morning. Amen. If you desire to see your friends and your loved ones saved, He can place a burden in your heart today. But it's left up to you this morning to determine whether or not you're going to walk close to God whether or not you really want to be used of God to make a difference in this community. Whether you want to experience everything that God has for you. And if you desire to be revived in the Spirit this morning. God looks at us today, I want him to see a church that's willing to stand in the gap, make up the hedge for souls. We're not afraid to drop to our knees and call on the name of Jesus for the lost people of this community. Because I believe that God has brought us to this place, to this kingdom, for this hour. I believe that he has put us here to have the Bible and to see souls saved. Amen. God is willing to the desire of his heart. It's really just left up to us if we're willing to do our part. If we'll move, if we'll step out in faith, if we're willing to have a burden, it is the will of God to pour out the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's just talk to him for a little bit. Do some self-reflection this morning. There's things that I need to change in my life. Some priorities that I need to rearrange a little bit. Maybe some things God's been dealing with me about that maybe Maybe it's okay for somebody else, just but for me, I know that it's permitting me from walking close to God, and I'm going to change some things. Because I want to be what He wants me to be. I want to please Him. I know He's not going to force Himself upon me, but I want to make Him aware that He is welcome in my life.
devil can try every trick in his arsenal. He can't defeat you. He can't stop you from being successful and living for God. Amen. He can do what he wants. Amen. But he doesn't have that kind of power. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you can be successful in your walk with God and you can have an influence on your family and your community, Amen. It is the devil that tries to convince us that there is no use in praying. Amen. That it's never going to make a difference. But I'm here to encourage you to keep praying. Yes. Keep walking. Amen. Keep drawing closer to God. And we're going to have revival. Amen. In this church yes. and in this community. Praise the Lord. Thank you for allowing me to preach to you this morning. I told my wife on the way to work, that we our way to work. <laughs> it is work sometimes, working for the Lord. On the way to church this morning, I told her, I said, what I'm going to preach is, I think it's more for me than it is the church, but that's what I'm going to preach, amen. And so I don't want you to think that I'm down on anybody or anything like that, amen. Maybe it's just me that needed to hear that this morning. Because it's so easy for us to get distracted, amen, and to not realize our purpose. And I don't think anybody ever had any bad intents, but sometimes we just let things get in our lives that distract us from the Lord. And every now and then we need to be reminded that yes. there's nothing more important than Him and our relationship with Him. Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. Stand. We're going to be dismissed here, but I want um, to ask Brother Rick to pray before we're dismissed. Amen. I know that he has a burden for this church, for this community, and it's not a burden that's just been in the last week or two. It's been years. It's hard. And I'm very careful not to say what's the will of God for somebody else's life, but this may be Rick and Kay's last service with us for a little bit, and the reason I say that is because I fully expect them to come back. Yes. <laughs> this is their home, Amen. and I don't think that someone that has a burden for this area like Brother Rick does, I don't think that God's going to wait till he leaves to send that revival. Amen. I want them to be a part of it. I want them to be a part of it. And I want them to know that this is their home and they are loved by this church. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother Rick, would you pray for us? Tell me to pray for us. Can I say one thing? Yes, sir. Lord,
what we are. I ask that you bless this church, this power come upon it, that your favor comes into this sanctuary like never before. That you will bless each and every one here, their families, their loved ones, their children and grandchildren. Lord, that there will be friends and that there will be a drawing, a magnetic pull of your power, Lord, that you fill this sanctuary with the opportunity with people that they will grow, draw closer to you. Go with each one into their homes and into their community and into the workplace where they go. It the influences that they have on people. And we ask all these favors in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Shake hands with somebody. Greet somebody in Jesus' name. You can be this.